Welcome to the Elliot Hulse Podcast. Podcast. I am the king of making men strong. Shedding of the old man, right? The way we can freely walk into rising, ascending, cleansing, sanctifying our soul for it's the Yo Elliot God. Show. I like that. Yo bros, it's your old Uncle Yo here, back with another episode, and today I want to talk about a topic that's near and dear to my heart and very much a critical need in our world today, and it's about masculine initiation. And so one thing I discovered in my search for even my own understanding of self uh, much less the support of men that I offer in this world today, is that there is a lack of initiation. And what does initiation even mean? So let me let me tell you a story. Maybe that's a good way for me to begin. When I turned 36 years old, I went from uh, living the life, right? I became very popular on YouTube. I was making a lot of money. I was a golden boy all around. People loved me left and right. They were traveling from all over the country just to visit me at my gym. I was at the peak. I was having a peak experience in my life. But right about the time I peaked, I began to recognize a crash in my life. I began to notice that I was falling apart mentally and emotionally. I, I lost a sense of stability in my life, and I didn't know what was going on. And by the grace of God, I was directed to this timeless pattern of masculine initiation as it was presented by Robert Moore through his studies of anthropologists like Mercer Eliade and Victor Turner, who studied traditional societies that still practiced and enacted the ritual initiation of men. And so I discovered at age 36 that I was going through a crisis in life, a very predictable crisis time. In fact, there's a crisis that emerges in the life of men every 12 years. You might not remember your 12th year or between the ages of 12 and 15, but that's when puberty hits. And so there's a loss of an old self and the bringing forth of a new self that is an initiation through biology, a very obvious and evident one just by looking. And if not given the right space, the right process, the right community, and the right eldership, leadership, that initiation process can be easily perverted. Uh, talking about a young man between the ages of 12 and 15, he can very easily get into gangs. He can very find, very easily find himself uh, being initiated through pornography and, and, and chasing pussy and uh, using drugs and doing all these things to get some sense of uh, ego gratification or sense of being in his life because of the confusion associated with the traversing of two stages. We know that to be a very tumultuous and turmoil-laden time in a young man's life, age 14, 15. Things can go very wrong if the right seeds aren't planted at that time. And then an interesting thing is that I've noticed over the course of time that more men at the age of 24 show up at my door than any other age bracket. And it's because as I've experienced at the age of 24 and discovered with the men that come to me is that that second cycle of 12, beginning at age 24, sends you into a brand new cycle. You, I say you're still a teenager until age 24. Even at 21, 22, 23, you're still sort of a kid. At age 24, there's a knocking at the door and you're on a brand new hero's journey. 
Between the ages of 24 and 27, most men are lost, not sure where to go, what to do, what's up from down. That's because you're going through an initiation at age 36. I experienced it again in my life because I remember the first two, but I couldn't put two and two together to figure out this pattern of 12. But I was directed, like I said, by the grace of God to the work of Robert Moore. And so some of the things that he discovered through his studies about masculine initiation, I would like to present to you here today, because I think that we can re-establish some of these patterns, some of these rituals, some of these ceremonies and meaning and, and practices in our modern day if they were honored and understood all forms of ritual initiation for masculine development follow a two-step pattern with four critical aspects. The movement away from the world of the mother is step one. And atonement with the world of the father is step two. Regardless of what cycle you're going through, and I, I propose that you're, you're, these always begin at the 12-year intervals. That number, again, once again, we live in a fractal universe. We live in a, God is a mathematical genius, if you will. And there are patterns that are evident everywhere. I mentioned the number four, right, before. But four fours is what? 12, right? Is that correct? No. Four, eight, 12. No, three fours is 12. Let me take that back. My math is off. I'm not a mathematical genius. <laughs> but this 12, let me just let me let me stick to what I was saying before. 12. What do we have? We have 12 hours on a clock, right? We have 12 months in a year. We have Jesus and his 12 disciples. Why 12? We have the 12 zodiac signs. Make it of it what you will. This aspect of 12 is absolutely a pattern in our lives and I've come to recognize and if you just look with open eyes you'll see the pattern of 12 working its way through your annual but also every 12 years of your life just look just pay attention now is this true is it scientific I don't think so but it is an essence of something greater it points to something more profound and so we can look at it and recognize patterns, right? Isn't that what makes human beings so powerful is pattern recognition. It's not always our quote unquote knowing and facts. It's our ability to recognize patterns. Intuition is pattern recognition. If you ever get a chance to read that book by Malcolm Gladwell, I think that's his name. Uh, he wrote a book called Blink and it's about geniuses who can figure things out in the blink of an eye. But then he surmises that no, they're not that it's not that they're geniuses, it's that they've seen enough patterns. And you see enough patterns, you see enough patterns, you see enough patterns, you start to see something emerge. This pattern of 12 is clearly emerged in my life and I watch it emerge in the life of men throughout my life. And so there's the 12 years that you're initiated into a brand new cycle, right? Think about midnight. Midnight is the end of one day and the beginning of a new one. Once it passes 12, once that long hand passes 12, you're now in the AM situation. It's not the same day. Once you get to 12 as age 12 and then you cross over, you're no longer that same boy. Think about it. From birth to age 12, you're a boy. At age 12, there's a crossing over and it's a spectrum. That's why I say between 12 and 15, right? Between 24 and 27, between 36 and 40. And it's usually that, you know, 12, 1, 2, 3 o'clock hour that the lights turn on. And then you're going into a whole different season. But anyway, where am I going with this? The pattern is always a movement away from what is known, which is referred to as the mother. What is known is material, right? Even the word mother comes from matter. The matter, the mother, right? Uh the material world, the matrix, if you will. That which is known, that which is manifest, even that ma, there's ma in manifest. Things that are manifest are like the ma, right? Because they give birth, the birth has been given. Ma, matter, matrix, maya, all of this. It's the illusion world or, or the world that is the manifestation, right? Of a deeper reality. 
What's associated with the world of the mother? World of the mother, comfort, uh, attachment, um, the 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 knowing of things, right? Who knows you more? Who do you know more than your mommy, right? Uh, addiction is also found in the overly attached man. I talked about the addicted lover before. The overly attached man who is grasping on material goods, created goods, mama's boys. So there's always a movement away from the mother. And the way that looks uh, cross-culturally, anthropologists discovered, and you can read about it in the book Iron John, is that there are elder men, the men of the tribe, the men of the society, that come in and physically remove the boy from the home of the mother, from, the, from under his mother's wing. And this usually is enacted at a time when he starts acting up. And it's not just the men that come in and, and, uh, and remove this boy from this world of comfort and knowing and, and mommy. The women also, because they want their men to be strong in the tribe, they collaborate, they conspire with the fathers to get this boy out from under my apron and cut off those apron strings. And so there's a literal removal of the boy from the world of this sensual gratification, comfort and ease of the mother. So that's the very first thing that has to happen in the form of initiation. I want to bring this up to you right now if you're a 24-year-old man, a 36-year-old man, or even a man who's thrust into an initiation that is unique to you. These patterns aren't written in stone. You can go through this at any time. It's a hero's journey. But does it look like the world around you is crumbling? Does it look like the world around you is fading in its vibrance? Does it look like, does it, is there a sense of confusion because the ground has been removed from underneath you? Are you going through a crisis of meaning, and a crisis of self, the destroying of an ego? I don't know myself anymore. Then you're being initiated by having the mother removed, the mommy boy destroyed, being taken away from sensual gratification, ego gratification, and anything that keeps you stuck as a younger or more immature version of yourself. That's step one. There's always a movement away from the mother. And like I say, in, uh, I hope you understand, it's a metaphor. It is literal when it comes to the mother, the first time through the clock. That's why when they're 12 years old, that's when most people think of initiation. But like I said, it keeps going. That first one, he's introduced then or atoned with the world of the father, the world of men, the world of pattern, the world of meaning and responsibility. A movement away from gratification and a movement towards responsibility. And so what that would look like in our ancestors' traditional way is that the men would then clean the slate so that the boy can be imprinted with resourceful meaning in his life. The cleaning of the slate would always come in the form of an austerity. Being removed from the world of the mother is a challenge in and of itself. It's an austerity. It's a, it's a pain of sorts. But the pain must drive deeper so that the boy's ego could break. So that they would subject him to number one, fasting. Always, everywhere, cross-culturally, there will be a fast if you're to be initiated. It's funny because around the age 36, I don't know why this happened, but I had this sense that I needed to stop eating. It's like God calls, right? And God calls you, the call to adventure, to stop stuffing your face with consumption, food, gratification. Always there's a fast. If you're not sure where to go in your life, you're not sure what to do, and it seems like your prayers aren't answered, fast. Because you're being initiated into a new self. And so the old self gets to die. And the fastest way to die to an old version of yourself is through denial. 
And the one thing that we take for granted because it's a consistent pattern in our life is consumption of food. You don't grow as a man until you fast. And so there's austerity. There's a fast. There's a fast from all the things that you find comfort in. So you might do a dopamine fast today if we're going to enact an initiation for modern man. Cut off yourself from alcohol, drugs, pornography, masturbation, chasing girls, playing with your phone, put it down. All these things that keep us hooked. You got to break yourself free from that. And listen, we don't have virtual elders as we did in the past. We don't even have fathers to do this for us. We live in a world that's lacking fathers, and that's why initiation no longer exists. It was the fathers that did that. The grandfathers did that. Now we just have a bunch of fuckboys who drop seeds and bounce. But I can't blame you. Women are perverted too. We live in a perverted society. And so we all suffer. Rant over. So the movement towards the world of the father is always preceded by austerity and challenge. The father's love is a critical love. Understand that, too, in a world that makes men uh, feel as if or think as if that we need to be more like women. We try to love like women. A woman's love is an emotional love. A father's love is a critical love. It's a mental love. It's a rational love. The reason being is that the father wants to see you be great. And the mother will love you even if you're a slapdick. You know this is true. You could be a complete degenerate drug addict retard and your mama will always love you. But your daddy, if he loves you, he'll probably slap you. So the father's critical love is a means of breaking down the baby boy ego, challenging him through austerities, fasting. For example, my brother, he was heavily involved in Native American spirituality when we were younger. And his ritual initiators took him up to the top of a mountain, took him to the edge of a cliff, sat him down on a rock, drew a circle around it, and said, don't move for three days. I think it was three days. For three days, he stayed on a rock. He sat there, and they called it a vision quest. Austerity, being austere. It's a challenge. What? Not just for the sake of challenge, but for the breakdown of the baby boy ego. The destruction of a version of yourself that's no longer useful. When I, when I turned age 36 and the world was crumbling down around me, I was addicted to an ego that had gotten me to where I was. And so I wanted to keep being that. And the world loved me as that. But God called me to something greater. But first, I had it to be broken down. There's a breakdown. But what ultimately ensues once the clean slate is established is the imprint of meaning this is where religion this is where mythology this is where story and purpose and meaning and mission are are installed in the new as a new software on the mo on the boy's mind Today, most of our initiations are pseudo-initiations. They are perverted initiations. They do not have a clean break from the mother. There's no clean break from the mother. This is why you have like these six foot seven, 340 pound football players who if you say anything about their mama, they cry, right? They're addicted to their cell phones. You take it away and they scream like a little girl. They might be giant men, tough looking men, men that will smash your face and crush your skull but they're still mama's boys because of an over-attachment to the mommy. Mama's boys. Giant mama's boys. Why? Well, there's no fathers. I can take this in so many different directions. So, but I want to, I want to, I want to just, just reiterate that imprint, that practice. There must be a movement away from the mother. The way that looks is a literal figure, a literal movement, and then austerity enacted. You must feel pain as a man. There is no man without sacrifice. There is no man without pain. There is no man without suffering. If your life is all comfort and you don't know what it's like to suffer, you don't know what it's like to be a man. It's Suffering is like 
the enzyme. It's, it ignites masculinity. This is why we subject ourselves to all forms of suffering in the gym. This is why men will do all kinds of things to punish themselves, hurt themselves, get involved in all kinds of self-destructive things because it's innate, it's deep, it's in our DNA. We sense that I must suffer. We sense that suffering is good. Don't be afraid to suffer. Don't be afraid to give yourself pain. Because it's, it's through that you must die. Do you ever have this sense? I, I have a very popular video on YouTube about suicide. This sense that I must die. And a lot of men don't understand. And so they literally take their life. That sense that you must die is not a wrong sense. It's right. It's just that your physical body doesn't need to die. It's your ego that needs to be eradicated. The ego you, the you that you're associated yourself with, the you that you're used to, the you that the world seems to know is no longer resourceful for the life that God is calling to you, calling you to, so that ego must die. You must die. This is why Christ say be born again. There's no born again unless there's a death to the old. You get an opportunity to do that at multiple intervals in your life, especially when you're called to a new life. You must die. So suicide makes sense, except you're going about it the wrong way. You got to die to the old and be born into the new. But the new, like I was saying before in our perverted world, usually comes in the form of chasing more effeminacy, chasing more addiction, chasing more worldly goods. So the imprint usually is, hey, can you make more money, buy more cars, buy nicer clothes, have sex with more women, uh, have, have more fun, you know, YOLO lifestyle, uh, being a lavish uh, luxury enjoyer, right? That's what the world portrays as being a man, masculine, right? You know, we have these, these celebrities who, who uh, demonstrate a form of perverted masculinity, that is all about ego gratification. There's no suffering. There's no responsibility. There's no growth. Big baby boys. And that's what most men hanker for. If you're hankering for uh, a, a, a damn Blazarian lifestyle, and I don't even know too much about that guy, so I'm not knocking him, but I understand what he represents. If you're craving that, you're craving your mama's tit, you big baby bitch. That's what you're craving. All those titties around him is because they're reminders of the breastfeeding his mama didn't give him or that he, that, that he still craves as a, as, a, as a baby boy. If you're craving titties that much that you have to have all those uh, plastic boobs around you, it's because you're a big baby who wants your mommy's titty in your mouth. Ha! Stop being a little bitch. You must suffer. There's no suffering when there's boobs around, right? There's no suffering when you have leather couches and, and comfort in your, in your car all day long. Now, I'm not saying those things are bad things, but that's not what makes a man. That's not what a man should strive after. That's not the imprint of the father on a boy or young man who's to return to the society, return to the tribe with a sense of dignity. There's no dignity in that. Those are, all, those are good things. All Created things are great. They're good. God created them. As a Catholic, we believe in the beauty of life. There's no denying the beauty and the good that God created. But there's putting it in right order. So I'm not saying don't want those things, but those things don't define a man. They're added to a man. But if, you have, if, you're, an, if you're a shallow man and you add those things to you, you're going to crumble on the inside eventually. What does the atonement of, with the Father look like in terms of pattern and meaning? I love to use this example. Do you remember that movie? So I grew up in the, in the 80s and 90s. So I don't know about the Lion King movie of today. I didn't see it. But when I was a kid, uh, the Disney movie, Lion King, probably one of the only really good Disney movies. I hate Disney. 
But that was a movie I remembered, and it was one that I watched quite a bit when I was a kid because I thought I was a lion. Maybe I am. And when the lion's father dies, right? Simba, his father dies. There's so much sim symbolism there. His father dies, and he's cast out into the wilderness. And he's traipsing about, living about a very unresourceful life. No meaning, no purpose, uh, and no tribe. He's traipsing about, but the ritual elder finds him, the old monkey, Rafiki. He says to him, what's the first thing he says to him? He says, you don't know who you are. <laughs> he looks at the Lion King himself, the Prince Simba, and says, you don't know who you are. Simba doesn't know who he is. You don't know who you are either. If you're chasing tits, you don't know who you are. I'm the old Rafiki, old Uncle E right here, ritual elder, looking at you, pointing at you and telling you, you don't know who you are. You don't know who you are. But I'll show you who you are. The same way the monkey showed Simba. What did he do? He took him to the top of the mountain. Always the top of the mountain is where we reach for God. He took him to the top of the mountain and he pointed up and he said, look. And what did he see in the stars but a pattern? I keep using this word pattern, but did you know that the word paternity and pattern have the same root word? Paternity is where we get the word pater, which in English we say father. He points up to the father. He points up to the pattern in the stars that is form in the form of his father. And he says, look, you are your father and you are your father's father and you are a manifestation of the many fathers that came before you and you carry a torch. There's meaning in that and you have a purpose. You are a king and you must carry yourself with the dignity of a king and you must go back to your people in a royal manner with meaning. And so, of course, in the movie, the young Lion gets it. He says, wow, I have a heavy responsibility. I have father energy poured out upon me. God the father. God the father being our existential primordial, the creator, our true father, because that's, the father is what? Is the pattern. It's not the thing. It's the pattern of the thing. It's the creation of the thing. If you look at a blueprint for a building, it's not the thing, but it's where the thing, how the thing is made. You have no creation without the pattern, without the blueprint. And so if you're not sure about who you are, what you're doing in life, look to the blueprint. Look to the blueprint for your life. Look for the pattern in your life. Look to God the Father in your life. And so this would have been installed in you, what I'm saying right now. And if you're an atheist or something, or you kind of cringe when I talk about God or Jesus Christ, it's because a different spirit was imprinted on you through the media and through the uh, secular culture, right? Through woke ideologies and communism, by the way, you got to understand that atheism is a fruit of communism, right? It's all one thing. Communists wanted to destroy uh, two things mainly so that they can unfold their nefarious plans. Two things, but it's one thing, and it is a father. It is a father. That's why families are destroyed today, because we live basically in a society that is communist. It's uh, neo-Marxist, if you will. I don't know. You know, They call it cultural Marxism, and anybody who says, that, says otherwise hasn't studied the work of Antonio Gramsci, the founder of cultural Marxism. And he said that in order for their plans to unfold, they needed to what? Remove the father. And he had a twofold mission in terms of removing the father. It was removing the father from the home. And uh, and he was very much influenced by Engels, who wrote a, a book and proposed the idea that the family is somehow a uh, oppressive structure. <laughs> you see what the destruction of the family has done, what it's wrought. Right. If it's so destructive, then if it's such an oppressive uh, unit, then why are we suffering without it? But anyway, he wanted to remove the father from the home, which he we obviously succeeded. And boy, that's another rabbit hole I could go down. And of course, I will at some point, but also remove God, the father. He said you need to de-Christianize the West. 
if you're ever going to pervert the society. And so we have no father. We have no God the Father because we're mostly basically neo-atheists, meaning, or you know what, not even atheists. We're, we're pagan in that we're self-worshippers. To be pagan is to, self, is to worship the self and to seek the self, you know, my ego, as the end-all, be-all, last meaning on earth. And so as self-worshippers, we're pagans, right? Pagan. And, uh, and this is an idea propounded by not just atheists, but Satanists. To worship yourself, do as thou wilt, right? Who was that? Uh, um, who, I can't even remember the name of these Satanists. Well, anyway, so do as thou wilt, right? And Disney is 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 a big initiator of men and women into that idea, right? Disney movies are all about the the young girl or you know a feminine little boy who wants to eschew the father's role who wants to overcome the father it's always about parents don't know anything you should do whatever you want you're smarter than everybody even though you're a lazy fat slap dick like that panda what was that movie kung fu panda you should be a hero that's what they're teaching you that's what they're initiating you with be a fat retard or that Lego movie. I only know these because my kids have watched them, right? And I hate Disney, but we've brought them into our home at times. The, 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 the Lego movie. The biggest dummy is the hero. And, so it's, and, and who's the bad guy? It's always the keeper of order. It's always the keeper of tradition. It's always the father. It's the bad guy. So we've removed all sense of order, all sense of pattern from our lives. And so you could see where not only are we addicted lovers, addicted to mommy, addicted to pleasure, big baby fags, but also have no meaning, have no father, have no purpose, have no pattern. And so I'm talking in terms of how things suck. And sometimes I go down these rabbit holes of suckiness, right? But I have a solution. There is a solution. In fact, it's not my solution. It's an ancient solution. It's a time tested primordial solution it's an archetypal solution it is a god delivered solution it's in our dna it's not something i made up it's something we've all forgotten and that's pretty much where we are as our society right like my people suffer because they do not know and we do not know because we're ignore ant right we live in a time where there's so much information how could you not know but you got guys like me who are interested so just listen to me and you'll learn a whole lot of stuff. So how, well, how is it that we have forgotten? Right. So when it comes to that pattern of initiation, a movement away from the world of the mother and atonement with the world of the father, there are four critical components that need to be present. And before I even get into this, I must say that it is my desire, not even that, it is God's work through me. I get out of the way these days and allow God to have his say. To bring back this process, this, these qualities that are associated with masculine ritual initiation. And I've, I've gifted the world with it through my grounding camps which I'll be bringing back here again pretty soon, but I might change the name. And if you do a little research on YouTube, Elliot Hulse Grounding Camp, well, you'll find my videos, but then you'll also find the videos of um, some pretty soft, effeminate sissy boys who, when they see what we do, don't understand and they like to criticize. But what could you say for initi uninitiated men? They just don't get it. So, you know, beware. You'll find some things that, uh, you know, go against what I'm saying, but, you know, it's up to you to decide. Uh, and also with my new 21-day King Initiation process, which you may have heard an ad for during some of my calls, and I'll be talking about because it is my uh, newest and greatest calling to life, and that is to initiate men through the processes uh, and through the means by which I'm going to share with you today. 
How does ritual initiation happen? Now, there are things that I can do and there are things that you can do and there are things that we can do in a very, you know, um, Mercer Eliade would call it a very pseudo initiation way because all the, all the elements, many of the elements are not present for us today. Kind of sucks. But I think we can get it back if we just know, right? The, the awareness in and of itself is transformative. So I figure that if I try my best and if I share this message, that eventually it's going to come back. And I understand something about myself. I'm a spark. I'm not the fire. I'm a spark. I'm not the flame. And as a result, a lot of times I get things going and somebody else takes it off. I've seen that happen with a thousand different things in my life. I look at things that people are doing. I'm like, hey, I did that first. But it doesn't matter because you know what the spark does? It dies in the flame. So I might have to die before I see this, before we see this be real. So anyway, there are four, there are four critical components of masculine initiation. And you'll find them in my live events. And you'll find them in my online coaching. Grounding camps, which I might change the name to King Camp. We'll see. Which are coming again very soon and my King Initiation program. You have a process. There must always be a ritual process. The overarching process is a movement away from the mother and an atonement with the world of the father. Some elements of that process are the things I spoke about before, austerity and meaning. But there's always a process. Fasting is a process. Dopamine detox is a process. Vision questing is a process. Taking boys out hunting is a process. You know, there were some societies that did that. Literally moving you away from your mother or setting you apart is a process, which give, brings us to number two. There's always a sacred space. Robert Moore put it this way, that it is only within the heat of a sealed oven that the transmutation happens. Just think about cooking food, right? Think about bread, right? You got dough. The only way that dough turns into bread is if it's in a sealed container filled with heat. Sacred space is a sealed container that is filled with heat. Now, it could be literal heat like a teepee that has a fire and you're suffering and struggling, trying to suck in all that hot air. That's true. That's real. That will challenge you. That will change you. But more so than that, it's Merely the setting aside of yourself, meaning that initiation can't happen in the profane world. It must be in a sacred world. How do you create a sacred world in a world that's, uh, that's permeated by profundity? You know, is that the right word, profane? It's just it permeated with sameness and blandness and media and just the gayness of our sick, sad, silly world. How do you get away from that? Well, you got to set yourself aside. You could set yourself aside by turning off the screens, literally just get rid of your phone and use a dumb phone for a while. Get off the internet. Go out into the wilderness somewhere. Go out somewhere else. Get away from the people, even those that love you. Yes, that might even mean your wife. Paul in, I believe, Corinthians makes it clear that it is right for a man and a woman. You know, this is, I speak in terms of men because that's who I serve, but it's not any different for women. It is different, but it's the same. He, although they owe each other their bodies, you know, that's just, that's the fact of the matter when you contract through marriage. I owe my wife my body, she owes me hers. You don't deny one another. Except for what? during a season of fasting and prayer, which means what? Initiation. So you might need to move away from your wife. She could keep you stuck in life if you don't break free from your addiction to her too. Your wife, your work. I was blessed at the age of 36 to have created a mo enough momentum and wealth in my life that I could take some time off, and that's what I did. My day-to-day -day life was in front of the screen making YouTube videos. And I disappeared for a time, and many of you guys know that, and I never came back the same. Those of you who have been following me, you know what I'm talking about. 
So there must be a setting aside. You must be set yourself apart. You must break the pattern of your mundane life. A pattern interrupt must be ensued. Just like the, you know, the dough that's kneaded on the outside and it's, you know, formed on the outside, it has to go into that oven so that it can be baked in the heat to grow. So that means that sacred space must also be a space of pain. Like I mentioned earlier about my brother going up to the mountain and sitting on a stone. It's painful. Fasting, painful. But anyway, sacred space. The third thing that's needed is a ritual elder, a leader or keeper of the space, a man that loves young men so much that he gives himself over for their growth. He might be considered like the cook in the kitchen who puts you in the oven, but he stays on the outside because he'll only he knows when you're done. The ritual elder comes in the form of fathers. Fathers, father figures, grandfathers. But specifically a man that's been there that has done that. A man who's been initiated himself. A man who holds the space, keeps the space, maintains the heat in the space, guides the process. There must be one. There must be a ritual elder. Initiation isn't a democratic process, <laughs> right? That's a part of the effeminate mindset. Even democracy itself is not very masculine at, at all. Men work in hierarchies. Monarchy is masculine, right? Men work in vertical lines. Women work in circles. Nothing wrong with that, but you got to know that there's a difference. So there's a hierarchy and you submit your will to the ritual elder. Think about how hard that is to even hear in a world where we're most of us think and act and behave like Eve, right? Rebellious women, even men. If you hear the word submit or you hear the word authority, right? And you cringe and you have a hard time, because I know I mention these words sometimes on, in, on social media and men cry and bitch and moan and whine like little girls. Don't tell me what to do. Rebellious, right? then you're thinking with the mind of your perverted mother, right? Because your mom probably never submitted to your father, right? And so you have no idea how to submit to an authority, to a man that loves you and takes responsibility for you. Well, that's what your ritual elder is. He's a father. And so you submit to your father. You submit to the father, the keeper of the space. Uh, or not, Right? This is, this is the whole deal with the world that we live in today. You have a choice. You could not. You could not submit to the process. You could not submit to sacred space. You could not submit to anything. But then guess what? You get nothing. And then finally, communitas is the fourth. Communitas is different than community because communitas is an emotional experience that is forged in the heat of communal challenge. What do I mean by that? So I played high school football and college football. And football camp, summer camp, two-a-days, was a form of initiation, right? You're basically initiating yourself into the new season. The coach is your ritual elder. And there's a process, which is the game. There's a sacred space, which is, you know, the locker room and the, and the football field. But communitas is what happens to the players on the team as they face those struggles in two-a-days, burning and sweating and huffing and puffing out in the sun together. There's a bond that's forged between the players when they suffer together. When you suffer together, there is a transcendent other that presents himself. You know, where God, Christ says that we're two or more or are, are join together in prayer, I'll be there. That's what communitas is. It's like the Holy Spirit. You can't make it happen. You can't create communitas. It just shows up through the, through the challenges, through the struggles, through the austerity, and through the people that are present in the sacred space. Communitas. And 
Communitas also extends outside of the sacred space because in a world where mothers and fathers and siblings and elders and you know the people you in your life in your tribe understand the critical importance and experience of initiation they support you too in other words when you've gone into the heat of transformation sacred space process and you come out on the other side there should be people there to recognize and facilitate the new you Many of the men come into my program, they'll go to my events or they'll go through my 21 day ritual initiation, masculine initiation, but the people in their lives are so devoid of understanding or meaning or compassion that they'll even jeer them and sneer at them. And when they come out on the other side, they just laugh at them and say, huh, what, what did you do that for? What are you dumb? What do you, you need something to help you become a man? Anybody who doesn't understand that men don't just become men, they're forged is living with their mother's mind. You don't get it. You don't, you, be, being a man must be taught, literally. And how do I know that being a man must be taught? Because if you live with nothing but your mother and a bunch of girls, you'll behave like a girl. This is why we've got so many effeminate men. Because there was no father to show them or to even transfer the food of his presence to him to give him a sense of what it is to be a man because the world hates masculinity. Why does the world hate masculinity? Because men create change. Men take up arms. Men are defiant and fight back. And if we can keep everybody docile and soft and distracted and addicted and mama's boys, well, then they're more easily controllable. This is why these things that I'm speaking about are so dangerous. This is why there's such animosity and anger and discomfort about the things that I'm speaking about. Because we've been bred to think that these things are wrong. We've been bred to think that you're okay the way you are. You're not. You're not okay the way you are. You're not good enough. Hear me out, you're not good enough. Anybody who tells you you're good enough the way you are is trying to be your mommy. Only your mommy would say that. And if a man tells you that, he's trying to be your mommy. I'm telling you, you're not good enough. We're not good enough. We're never good enough. And that's why this process of initiation is ongoing. You can always be stronger. You can always do more. You can always be a better servant, provider, leader. The process is never done. So that's it. Communitas requires that the whole community understands. The women in traditional societies marveled and, and were joyful at this process happening for men because, well, back then, they needed their boys to be men. Right now, your mommy probably wants to keep you as a mommy, as a boy, because she doesn't need you to be a man, right? Because there's no barbarians banging at the door. So if she can keep you weak and the world can keep you weak, well, then there's no need for communitas. And so that's it. That's all. That's what I wanted to share with y'all. And I would love for you to enjoy me in the reignition of masculine initiation. And so you could join me by going to kinginitiation.com or going to one of my events. But either way, it's neither here nor there. If you decide you don't want to sacrifice by joining, because you got to pay. There's always a sacrifice if there's going to be growth. There's no king without a sacrifice. And so, of course, you put money in my pocket, which is good, because I can feed my children. But at the same time, if you don't pay me and you have no skin in the game, there's a very good chance that you're not going to benefit. That's just the way it is. That's why even in the times of old, there's always been a sacrifice. You've got to come to the temple with something. You've got to have some skin in the game. And But if you decide you want to go it on your own, you can. Just follow the things that I'm talking about. I'll be talking more about it. Try it out on your own. But if you want to join a like-minded group of men and you want the ritual eldership of a man that loves you and cares for you and wants to see you change because I want to see men strong again. I want to see families great again. 
and we'll see our culture rise again, well, then join me. And that's it. I'm done. Until next time, old Uncle E, I'm out.